Everybody agreed, Brother Branham, that uh, if you wanted to stay till 6 o'clock, 5 or 6 o'clock, we, uh, uh, <laughs> you can just take all the time you want. Brother. Thank you very much. <laughs> that nobody has to go home before 5, 6. <laughs> so we, we appreciate it if you Thank would take. And just before I turn it to Brother Branham, uh, there was a man that was here last time that uh, he was here to speak to us that had cancer. And then uh, he was called out in the meeting at uh, Brother uh, Max Church and uh, told what he had and so on. And then... Uh, Good morning, friends. You can sit down. Uh, it's good to be back on the back side of the desert. You know, we, I believe the last time I was here, I titled this place the back side of the desert. That's where we usually find uh, the Lord, or where it was found one time when Moses was herding the sheep at the back side of the desert. This fellow here, uh, I picked him up in a rearview mirror a while ago, <laughs> coming down. I heard the other day he was in the hospital. I was praying for him, and here he's sitting here. Oh, well, that's good. I'm so glad. He had a bleeding. And so we so glad to see him in this morning. Sorry to hear about this brother that was with us the last time here. He's got cancer in the hospital. We know that we only have one avenue out of this, and that's the avenue of death. That's, we all have got to walk that path, whether we the most righteous, the most holy one of us, we pack one another over the other one's grave. And yet Jesus said, He that leaveth to me shall never die. But what the death is there is not what we call death. Like when Jesus spoke about Lazarus, he said, He sleepeth. And they said, Well, we, uh, um, he does well if he sleeps. And Jesus had to tell them in the language they knew, see, he's dead. He said, And for your sake, I'm glad it wasn't there, but I go wake him. And that's when he made that wonderful quotation we have in the Scripture. He that heareth, he that believeth on me has everlasting life, shall not come into the judgment, but pass from death unto life. I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. See? Never die. There's, no, there's really no death to a Christian. He... Death means eternal separation. And now, as when we are die, like in the physical body as we are now, we are separated from one another. But it's really this body is the only thing that identifies us to each other because we are bound in five senses, see, taste, feel, smell, and hear. And as long as we can see or feel one another, while we have evidence that we're here. If you're blind and can't... And, uh, and can't see, then you can feel uh, one another, and we are here one another. And the earthly senses declare one another. But really, frankly, we have never seen each other. Did you know that? We have never seen one another. You hear something speaking out of a body here that impersonates whatever it's on the inside. So then when we talk to each other, we're, we're really not talking to the body it's the spirit inside, but the body is the thing that identifies with the spirit that's on the inside. And therefore, when we speak to each other, we are quickly can understand right away whether we are Christians or not because there's a fellowship in the spirit that we talk from. You see, that it vibrates to one another that whether we are Christians or not. Therefore, we have never seen each other. Jesus, uh, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of the Father has declared him, you see. In other words, God was identified. The, the person of God was identified in the body, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was the express image of God, or God expressed himself through an image, thing, through an image man. God expressed himself to us, and he was God. Not a third person or second person. He was the person God. He was God himself uh, identifying himself so we could feel him. Well, uh, First Timothy three sixteen. Without controversy, that's argument. Great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested or made known in the flesh. Isn't that wonderful, God, and we could never understand God as He moved through a pillar of fire and uh, so forth as He did. But we understood Him when He became one of us. 
thing, when he become man, now he could talk to us and we could feel him, handle him, touch him, and everything. And as the Scripture plainly says, that we have handled God, see, with our hands, touched him with our hands. God is in man, and he's identifying himself today in his church, in the born-again Christian, God identifies himself that he remains God. And the outside world will only know God as they see God in you and I. That's the only way that they'll know God is when we are written epistles, epistle of the Scripture, we are read of all man. And the life that we live reflects what's on the inside of us. A man is identified by the works that he does. So our works should be good. See, always good because we are representing our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing that is, especially when a, an old man like me is standing here and, and think of uh, the life that is fading away, that's gone in the past, and, and we're uh, facing a future of an eternity. And knowing if this life only is what I had hopes in, I would be a most miserable person this morning. But knowing that this life has only been uh, a shadow of what we have to, to come, it's a reflection because it cannot be the perfect thing that God made. God doesn't make anything that perishes. See? God is eternal. And therefore, this life that we now live in is only reflecting what is ahead of us, the real one that cannot die, the body that cannot perish, the life that cannot be taken. See? And therefore, the Scriptures is right when it says that we have everlasting life. We have eternal life. We can never die, see, because you become, when you're born again, you become a part of God. See, you are forever, for eternity, never to fail. You are part of God because you're His Son. Now, I might take another name and say my name is uh, some other name. I might take my mother's name, Harvey, which would be the closest to me uh, uh, in the world. My mother was a Harvey. And then I might take the name of Harvey. But still, the blood would prove that I am a Bram. See, because I'm part of my father. And as long as i got blood in me, I'll still be part of my father. See, that's right. And when I'm born of the Spirit of God, I am a part of God. That's all. I am identified with Him. See, and He is my father. Then my life should reflect Him as my life re reflects my earthly father, in the image that he was in, uh, they say, I look a whole lot like my father. So then, therefore, it's his image reflected in me, and your father reflected in you and your parents. And so God, our father, is reflected in us when we're born and, and conformed here to his image. Now, I start talking, never get to my text, so what I was going to talk to you about. I have always appreciated a house meeting cottage prayer meeting such as this more than and I guess people could think that I would because the finest meetings the finest times of fellowship is usually in a little cottage prayer meeting like this where I have felt the closest to God is when just a little handful of believers comes together and there we worship now this morning I suppose we sit here at 30 40 30 I guess or something like that Counting the children, I wouldn't know. I'm not very good on 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 counting the numbers just to look over a little a group of people because these other rooms here, you see, that I don't see the people in them. Now, but when we come together like this, I feel that we get a closeness that we don't get uh, when we're out in a great, huge congregation. We can express ourselves. That's why this morning, and I thought coming down here, that I would speak to uh, the congregation here this morning and to its lovely little pastor. So glad to see many of my friends here, Strickers and all those that, that I haven't seen for some time. And um, I would speak this morning to you my New Year's message that I had planned for speaking next Sunday uh, afternoon at the Phoenix meeting at the auditorium. Because in here I thought maybe they're making tapes out there of it, that I maybe the Holy Spirit would give me a, a better thought here amongst just a bunch of believers than perhaps it would be at Phoenix amongst uh, you know where the belief and unbelief and superstitions and and everything's mixed together. 
And then if the brethren had, in letting the tapes out, it would be um, it would be better to do it that way because you'd have a better tape from here. I asked the boys to check the acoustics first. And when I come in this morning, Brother Terry told me that the acoustics were fine. So that's, that's good. So now, uh, let us first, before we approach this solemn affair, and I know, I believe he said some of you are staying for lunch. You're going to have lunch here on the ground or at the house or something together. That's very fine. I just sure appreciate uh, seeing you all get together. And I feel that, that my message this morning is addressed to the church of the living God, see, and uh, which I believe this is a portion of it sitting here this morning. And now, before we come to the, that solemn part, let's bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you that we can even be privileged to address you as our Father. For a Father means that we have been begotten of the great God that created the heavens and earth. And we are so happy for this privilege that we can think in our hearts and then that we are sons and daughters of yours. And then to see you strictly identify yourself in the midst of us that you are our Father, changing our thoughts from the things of the world and changing our motives and objectives and attitudes and every phase of us to love you and to believe you and and know that your promises are true. We have assembled here this morning in this place that we call the backside of the desert, or I call it that. Thinking it, reason I say that, Lord, is not to reflect anything upon this little group of people, but of anything that would be of a nature of being small. But I'm trying to think that it was Moses, your servant, who was at the backside of the desert. Maybe just he and his sheep. Maybe his wife, Zephra, and, and uh, Gershom, his son, might have been along. I, that I do not know. But it was there that they had an experience that changed that prophet from a runaway coward to the service of the God who had ordained him for the job on the back side of the desert. It was there that, that the pillar of fire that was made manifest for the first time in human life that we know of, that fire was laying back in a little desert bush. And it burnt not, but it was a glory of God reflecting itself through that bush that Moses, the prophet, taken off his shoes, drawed nigh unto it and was commissioned by God to deliver a nation of God's people. May it be so again today, Lord, on the backside of the desert that we now take off as it was our shoes, our hats, our all, and lay it down beneath the cross of Christ and say, Here am I, Lord, send me. Bless this pastor here, our brother Isaacson, brother we pray that you bless him and his wife and his little ones, Brother Stricker, his wife and little ones and all the others that's represented here this morning. And we've assembled here, no, Lord, not for some great glory or to be known uh, as leaders or, or some uh, an official of something great. We are, we are just here as humble believers. We're here because we love you and we love one another. And as we see each other and as we congregate together, we find that it seems to be more of God gathers together as each believer assembles himself in a one certain place. And Jesus said, if you'll do this in my name, then I'll be in your midst. And we know that you're here. Speak to us, Lord. And if these little note that I got wrote out here in scriptures to refer to is off of the path this morning of the thought that you'd have us to think then Lord we we'll just omit that and do as you tell us to do bless us now for we ask this in Jesus Christ's name amen now in the reading of the scripture it used to be that I before I got 
so much age on me that I could remember good. And in them days, I, young days, I didn't take a long message, maybe 30 minutes or something. I plowed right into one thought and kept it on my mind. But now, I, the reason I hold these long meetings now is because I'm taping. See? And this tape, the boys, their tape in it will start it at a certain time, perhaps now at the beginning of the prayer, and it goes many, many places around the world, practically. So we are now going to speak this morning on my New Year's, what we call my New Year's message. I tried, had three Christmas messages, and I know you people down here at the back of the desert get those tapes. And on my, on my last message up at the church, or next to my last message, was on the light. Uh, and uh, if you haven't got that tape, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. I enjoyed it very much, the inspiration of it uh, the Lord gave me. Now, today as we face New Year's, I, I want to think of not like the past, but I want to look to the future. See? As Paul said, forgetting those things that are in the past, I press towards the mark. See? Of the high calling. And as it's expressed uh, like looking back through the mirror of a car, we are looking what we have passed when we're looking in the rear view mirror. Now, we're not trying to place the message today as looking through a rear view mirror. It would take too long. See, the things that the Lord has did, and you're all acquainted with the great uh, things that our Lord has been doing, it is some of the mightiest things that I've ever seen in my life. He's just, just passing in the last few months. and um, But now we are thankful for what has been. But now we're looking forward. We're looking where we're headed for and into this 1964. And now, if you here like to read, or, or I'd like to read some scriptures because all this is based upon God's holy word. And I uh, Leaves me now about an hour and 15 minutes for this tape. Uh, Lord willing, I'll try to get it out so you can have your dinner. I thank you for telling me that I had till 6 o'clock tonight. That was very nice. Now, let's turn in the Bible to two places. The books lay close together. It's in the Old Testament. I take the text or the writ reading from two places, Isaiah 62 and Psalms 60. Uh, in Isaiah 62, we will turn to read first. And in this, we are minded uh, of the great powers of our Lord uh, God and how, how great He is and how mighty our God is. I am sorry, it's Isaiah 60 instead of 62. Isaiah 60. All right. Now, we read this. Isaiah 60, 1 and 2. Arise and shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee gross darkness upon the people. Uh, this, of course, this is a prophesying of the day that we're now living. Now, let us turn then to Psalms. I believe that I may be a little confused where I broke my scriptures down here when I, in a hurry uh, last night in writing them, um, writing out this uh, Psalms 62, 1 to 8. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain of all of you as a Owing vine wall shall be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from the excellency. They delight in lies. They bless their 
with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectations is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him all the times. Ye people, pour out your hearts before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Now, if you noticed in the Scripture reading there in the Psalms, it kept saying, God is my rock. You know what a rock represents in the Bible? A rock in the Bible here represents the revelation of God. See? God is my revelation. He is... See, the revelation of the Word is the rock. Because... Peter, one day, when Jesus had asked the question, Who does man say I, the Son of Man, am? And one of them said, You are, some of them say, You are Moses or the Elijah, or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But that wasn't the question, Who do you say I am? He, Peter spoke up these famous words and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock. See? And David speaking here, God is our rock. God is our rock when God has been revealed to us. That becomes a rock. See? God is our rock. Now, my text for this morning is a odd word. Shalom. Shalom. In the Hebrew means peace. And that's what I say to the church this morning. Shalom. That's peace. In Finnish it's called Yumalan Raha, which means God's peace upon you. Raha, God. See? God's peace. Shalom. My New Year's message is to the church elected in Jesus Christ for 1964. Not, uh, not just the church groups, but the elect, the lady, uh, the lady of, of the church, Christ's bride. See, that's who I'm addressing. We're facing here in our two subjects that we read, the two scriptures, rather, a very... Uh, contrasts one to the other. In Isaiah it says, Rise and shine, for the glory of God has come upon you. The light is here. And then the very next verse he says, Gross darkness is upon this people. And then when we are in a mixture of light and darkness, and then my uh, address to the church is shalom, peace. Let's find out what it's all about. See? We are facing this year with both darkness and light. We are, the world is in one of the most chaotic times of darkness that it's ever stood in. And yet it's standing in, the, again, the most blessed light that it ever shined in. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, the difference is just like it was in the beginning when there was gross darkness upon the earth and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of water and said, Let there be light. And God separated the light from the darkness. And I believe that we are now living in that hour again that when God is separating light from darkness Amen. and He's pressing it to the other side of the world that the light might be made manifest. And we are... Uh, then the, the church, the reason I'd say shalom to them is because that it's 
God's peace. That's what I want to bring to you this morning for the New Year's. Uh, not looking back, but we're looking forward to the breaking of a new day until there is something great laying uh, ahead of us where the years has been the joy that we've looked forward to, the pressing coming of the great light, and now we can see it breaking over the horizontal, horizontal realm of be breaking between mortal and immortality. We see it breaking between uh, heavens and earth, from an earthbound sickness and troubled world into a, a bright shining day of an immortal life and an immortal body and an immortal earth that should never pass away. It, it's, it's shalom until the, unto the church. Now, uh, it's like time coming for the believers, but a gross darkness for the people. I, uh, the other day, uh, we was talking, a wife and I, and uh, we were talking about the, the hour that we're living in. I, the reason I chose this place, I felt like I could just let out and talk to you. See, thing. It's, um, it, there seems to be a time that's upon the people that it's the most pathetic time that I could think about. I have constantly done my very best to try to, in disagreeing with man in religious terms, but if I couldn't take his hand afterwards, no matter how sharp the thing might be, and take hold of his hands and say, this is in the light of a better understanding between us, and still love the person, not just say it from my lips but from my heart, then I'm no no subject at all to go out there and, and to try to talk to people. Because, see, we must do that. We must love the person. See? And um, going amongst the people in all kinds of classes and different cults and clans and religions and so forth, and trying to lay the Bible down and say, let's, let's discuss it not from your creed or from your book of ethics, but from the Bible. And then, not, uh, maybe sometime man get up real sharp, but if I got one thought that I uh, didn't like that person, then, uh, then the, the, I know one thing, the Spirit of Christ has departed from me. If I, if I can feel that I don't, don't like that person, there's something wrong with me. Because the Spirit of Christ, when they uh, the, at, at crucifying him, and at his own people driving the nails and and his very creation he created was putting the nails that he created back into his human flesh. And yet with a heart full of love, he cried, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, you see. And I, I've come to that spot. I believe that people don't know what they're doing. It comes to the time to where uh, the human being has looked like become such a subject of evil. Uh, until it's a pathetic thing. It seems like there, there's a shadow of darkness just over the people that presses them. Uh, like, for instance, this one thing, crossing the nation around and speaking in the Lord God, identifying, vindicating His Word and showing that's exactly and never let nothing be said unless it comes to pass exactly what He said, speaking it right into existence and so forth as He's been doing. And people sit and look at that and continue right on in their same condition. Yes. Amen. See, um, uh, not any disregarding, but uh, like our sisters many times, uh, I speak to them about wearing those clothes and cutting their hair and little things, and man, how they'll continue on into their creeds and, and serve under those creeds and things. And, and they're good people. They're fine people. But... Yet it seems like that they, they, they can't understand, look like they can't get it. Why? I go back the next year and instead of being any better, it's worse. It, it continues on. Here's a sister that once had lovely long hair. She cut it off. Here's a man that once looked like he took his stand and went out for the thing was right. He's right back in the, like a dog to its vomit and a, and a hog to its waller. See? Goes right back out in it. It seems like there's something that has struck our people, that struck the world, that they don't seem to have the, the understanding or something's wrong. 
Uh, just like you notice man today. You don't find that genuineness in man. You don't find it in women. Now, I'm not talking about... The uh, reason I'm basing this is get the shalom. See? But you notice the women in our day. They don't seem to have that lady like uh, they once had. They're, they're, it looks like they, they want to, but there's something won't let them do it. It seems like there's a heaviness that you tell a, a lady that she should not do such and such a thing, and the lady looks upon that and believes that. She wants to believe that, but there's something that presses her the other way. Amen. Yeah. Poor thing, I, I feel sorry for her. She's so caught in such a web of Hollywood and the advertisements and television, radio, newspaper, on the street, in the store windows, with modern dress and so forth, and the way that other women need her. And the, it seems to be that there is something that they just can't pull away from. Our young people, our old people, our middle age, there seems to be something among man. Uh, man don't seem to be have that uh, masculine touch that he used to have. Women don't have that feminist touch she used to have. You take man today. Man don't seem to be burly like they used to be. It's all some sort of a... They want to wear uh, suede shoes with purple and, and uh, they want to uh, 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 act like women. Amen. Now that is true. It's, it seems to be more or less like a perversion. Uh, a woman wants to cut off her hair and, and act like a, a man. And a man wants to act like a woman. See? And uh, yet you can talk to them and they're nice people to talk to. Nice people. Friendly, sociable people. What's caused this? It's that gross darkness upon the people. It's something that's, that's pressed them into it. Like the Jews was in the days that Jesus came to the earth. Isaiah had prophesied of it and said, there would be, uh, they would have eyes but couldn't see, and ears and couldn't hear. And that's the reason Jesus prayed their forgiveness, because it had to be that way to fulfill the Scripture. And it's returned again to us. The Bible has spoke of this day that we live, and said these things would come. Gross darkness upon the people, and we see it. That there's something that just simply the people want to, but they can't. Nicodemus expressed it one time before the Lord. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Amen. For no man could do the things that you do if God wasn't with him. Amen. But it was that darkness or blindness upon the Jewish race that the Messiah might come to take from the Gentiles a bride. They had to reject him. And that's the gross darkness that's up on the churches and things today. To fail to see the light that's shining. Amen. Amen. See, there seems to be such a heavy press. We take the, some of the noted evangelists today, they are constantly screaming for a revival and working right against it. Amen. 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 Not understanding without understanding. And I don't say that in the, the motive of trying to say, now, uh, we've seen this and glory to God, they, they're not in it. I'm not trying to, to say that in the, uh, to get people to think, well, Brother Branham, you, you got the only truth there is in the world. No, that is wrong. See, I'm only saying it in the light of the hour that we're walking in and for the benefit of people who are trying to seek this light. Truly, Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. No man will never sit. It's that predestinated seed and that only is going to receive it. Amen. But we come to that place again. The Bible said that you're the light of the world. The prophet said, gross darkness upon the people. 
upon the people of the world at this time, and that's exactly what we've got. Gross darkness upon the people. God, in His great mercy, as I have always preached and tried to stand for, that He always shows His, his events from heaven, His great major events, happens in heaven before it happens on earth. Amen. He reflects Himself. In other words, before Messiah uh, came into a place where His ministry would start, there came forth a, a star out of heaven Amen. that guided the man uh, to the, the, the place where he was. The wise man, as you heard in my last message, how that God dealt with the, the wise man. And, and in the day that he, he turned him aside by a dream and he told Joseph by a dream how to take care of the welfare of his own son because he had the dream. There was... A dream is secondarily something off to one side because people can have dreams that's not right. But there was no prophet in the land in that day. See? There was no prophet. Therefore, God had to use what he had to use with. And it teaches us that, that God can use every faculty and everything that we do if it's consecrated to him. But it first must be consecrated to him. Let your, your meditations, which really reflects your dream, see, because it's your subconscious. If you watch a dream, you'll see that it's something you've been thinking of or something like that usually, you see. And let your mind be on God then, see. So it reflects something for Him. And whatever you are, uh, let it reflect Him. Now, in the heavens above, did you notice I'm looking on the, uh, the, um, the light uh, on the picture there out of the Life magazine that uh, the brother lives here in his home has... Um, uh, uh, put on his wall uh, that uh, triangle of uh, light. I just happened to run across my mind. If any of you has the Lamza Bible translation, if you'll notice over the cover of it is a triune Trinitarian light, a three-cornered light like a halo. And um, when Dr. Lamza, a friend, my personal friend, was translating the Bible. That is the old Hebrew symbol of God in the true Trinitarian way that He is. Not three gods, but three manifestations of the same God. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The light is one complete circle of light in a triangle shape, which means that God will dwell in three offices the fatherhood, sonship, and Holy Ghost dispensation, all the same God. But did you notice before the seven seals was revealed, before the great mysterious light showed forth in the heavens uh, uh, up here at above Tucson, Flagstaff, where we were, Brother Fred, two of the men that was, the two men was with me that morning, when that we've been told months and months ahead of time would happen, both Brother Fred uh, Southman and Brother Gene Norman sitting here this morning when it was there when the blast went off. Amen. And not knowing these things would take place, and he sent me back, said that the time was at hand for these seven seals, which held the seven mysteries of the entire Bible, Amen. was sealed in with these seven seals, and how these angels down along the road uh, messengers of the uh, church ages open to a certain part of that. But in the seventh hour, the seventh messenger, that all these mysteries should be finished. Amen. The seventh earthly messenger. See, this angel that he speaks of then was on earth. Uh, angel means messenger. And then after that, he saw another angel coming down. Not the earthly angel that had been given the message here, but the Another mighty angel came from heaven with a rainbow over him and set his foot on the land and sea and swore by him that lives forever and ever, time shall be no more. Amen. But before he broke forth on those seven seals to reveal them that he showed miraculously, he showed it first in the heavens. Amen. That day they took pictures all across southern United States and Mexico. There it hangs down in the Life magazine. Still a mystery to them. Amen. But he declares it Amen. in the heavens. 
before he does it on earth. He always does that. He shows his signs in the heavens first. And even in the zodiac. I'm not going back to teach zodiac, but I'm just showing you the heavens declare it. In the zodiac, we find out in the constellations of the stars that he declared the whole Bible in the constellation of the, of the zodiac. We find out there that he starts off the per, very first figure in the um, zodiac is the virgin. And the last figure in the zodiac is Leo the lion, showing that Jesus had come first to the earth by a virgin. He'll come the second time as a lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. He goes through the cross fishes just before that cancer age, what we're living in now. And all the heavens declare him, the Bible said. Now, a few months ago, I preached for a series of meetings at the tabernacle on the seven church ages. You perhaps all have heard them. And when I finish drawing out on the blackboard the seven church ages, how the light come in and how the light went out. And I guess you have that perhaps here somewhere. But it's among us anyhow, we know. Amen. And the strange thing on the last day when the last church age was drawn out, this great pillar of fire, which is among us, Amen. came down Amen. among hundreds of people and tuck itself back to the back wall of the tabernacle. And there before these hundreds, draw those church ages, darkening and lightening, just exactly the way I had it drawn on the board, Amen. mysteriously. Now, the other day, we've had in the event of the history of the church sound, in the, the Bible, the moon represents the church. And the uh, sun represents Christ. Amen. For we find that in Revelation, the 12th chapter, the woman which was the church, she was found with the moon under her feet and the sun at her head. Twelve stars in her crown, which the, the old Orthodox Jewish uh, law was under her feet. She had crossed over that into the light of the sun. Twelve stars were the twelve apostles that brought the messages to us. Now, under the Holy Spirit, now we find that the moon in the heavens is to reflect the light of the sun in the absence of the sun. It gives, us, it gives us light to get around. But it's still, no matter how much it reflects, it's still not the perfect light because it is reflecting. Amen. And the sun shines against the moon and the moon reflects its light in the absence of the sun. But when the sun comes up, then the moon is not needed no more. Amen. And today the church is reflecting the light of the absent sun of God. The church is a reflection of the light because he said a little while and the world seeth me no more yet ye shall see me for I will be with you even in you to the end of the age. The works that I do are lights that he made manifest and there's no light except through the word of God. Amen. There was that son is the word of God. In the beginning God said let there be light. And when the manifested Word of God, when the Word of God was manifested, there was light. Amen. First God spoke it. What if it didn't manifest? Then it wasn't light yet. But when He spoke it and then it was manifested, vindicated, His Word was a vindicated light come into existence. Amen. That's the only way it can be done now. Amen. It's when the Word is vindicated, God's written Word a vindicated, then it shows light. Amen. It's a portion is lit or put out for each age. We find it in the church ages. We find it in the Old, the Old Testament church ages. Each time that there come a time for a, a certain manifestation of a journey, there was a prophet came to the earth, and the Word came to the prophet, and he made that Word live. Amen. And when that Word was identified, it reflected God. Amen. And there was the, the age. There was a light. 
That's the way light comes today. Now, I have nothing against any denomination, uh, people, but I have all that I can think about against the systems because they're wrong. And the first system that ever rose up was the, the Roman system of the Roman Catholic Church. That was the first organization that ever was organized was the Roman Catholic Church. Nicaea Rome, about 325 years after the death of Christ. 325 came forth the Roman uh, Church organization that put the people together and blanted out anything else that was contrary to it. That's where they got their strange doctrines and started off in a system away from the Word. Hmm? And now that church since that time has exactly reflected darkness because at that time we go through what we call the dark ages, about a thousand years. It's known to all historians and Bible scholars and so forth as the dark ages. It's when the Roman church controlled everything. And this Roman church is the, the mother of harlots, the Bible said in Revelation 17. She was the whore and mother of harlots. Now that is immoral, unclean living of a woman. Both of them is the same thing. Both the same. So if, if a harlot, it have to be a woman. So therefore, you notice it's not harlot, but harlots. See? She is her singular whore. Then the churches is called harlots. Daughters of the Roman uh, whore. She is the mother of all of it. The mother of organization. And is it not a strange thing that in this day that when we have come through all these things and the message has crossed the earth against organization, it's blasted it from right to left? That in this hour that's been told since 1933 when the Holy Spirit gave me that visions and showed me the end time, seven things that I spoke of and five of them has already happened perfectly right on like Germany and, and Italy and all the wars and the national things. Selim speaks to me on those things. But they happened just exactly the way he said they'd happen. How Mussolini would go to Ethiopia and Ethiopia would fall at his step. And then how did he come to a disgrace and be spit on by his own people and disgrace hung upside down with that prostitute that he lived with on the street? How that the Americans would go to war with Germany to take an awful beating at a place called a Great Line where there would be concrete fortified in there. I believe it's called the Siegfried Line. And uh, there's one called Maginot. I believe that was the French. Was that right? And the Siegfried Line was the German line. And the Lord let me see that 11 years before it was built. Amen. And they never would admit getting a beating on it. The Americans wouldn't, though they almost sunk the complete army. When they went in there, the Germans had their guns just trained right out on that fleet and let it get right in there and almost sunk it. I've seen that 11 years before the line was ever, ever foundation was ever poured for it or anything, the Siegfried Line. And all these other things like machines and automobiles and, and how everything has come right down exactly what he said until a woman ruling this nation, which perhaps Amen. is the church. Amen. And then the end come. Now, we find that in this all this thing and how blasted against organization, isn't it a strange thing that the Pope of Rome would leave Rome for his first time to go back to Jerusalem? Amen. Amen. And Doing this, Jerusalem is known the oldest church in all the world. When Melchizedek met Abraham from the slaughter of the kings, he was a king of Jerusalem, a priest, which was Christ. It was God. No one else could be Melchizedek but Christ himself. A uh, God himself, rather. God himself, because he was without father and without mother. See? Jesus had both father and mother. See? So this man was without father, without mother, 
without beginning your days or ending of life. And whoever he was, he still lives. And he was king at that time of Salem, which is interpreted king of peace. Shalom. King of Jerusalem, who met Abraham and gave him wine and bread communion after the battle. A very beautiful type there in the seventh chapter of Hebrews. We find it. Now, gave him bread and wine after the battle was over. As he, that's the first thing we'll take after we enter into the new kingdom. We'll eat it anew with him in the Father's kingdom, the bread and wine. I'll not drink the fruit of the vine or eat the bread anymore until I eat it anew in the Father's kingdom that day. Now, now when we find out that after King Shalom was in the, the come from the city, then Creed took it over later. And it's constantly been Creed, but it represents the old church. And we're taught in the New Testament, don't fail to get this in the New Testament, that we are not of this city, Jerusalem on earth, but we are from the new Jerusalem Amen. above. So this must be the moon Jerusalem Amen. and not the new Jerusalem above. So the moon representing the church, earthly, and uh, isn't it strange that just before the Pope took his journey uh, to Jerusalem, that the moon in the heavens made a total blackout Amen. just a few days before he took it, his journey. He's coming here also, you know. See. Now, that's never been known. See? But what does it show that this he's doing this to win the fellowship as he met on the day after he come into Jerusalem? He met the Greek Orthodox uh, hierarchy. And what does that reflect? Fellowship, they're wanting. Amen. Protestants and Catholicism joining together, which they are doing and will completely do. Amen. And God reflected this to us in the moon of a total blackout. By His mercy and grace, did any of you see the paper where they took the pictures of the moon? I have it here. If it ain't a perfect image, leaving out the seventh age, which is not yet, exactly the way I draw it by the Holy Spirit, the church ages. Amen. There's the six of them. The seventh is not finished yet. The six conditions of the moon, how in its brightness in the first church age, Dark in the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Just the way the Holy Spirit let me draw them on the board and then identified them with Himself on the wall of the tabernacle Amen. two years ago. The moon reflects itself and science again picks up the picture of the church ages. Amen. Just as they picked up that light under and put it in Life magazine, of the opening of the seals, yeah. of the revealing in the age of the seventh angel. Amen. In the days of his ministry, the seventh messenger, the mysteries of God, which all the mysteries have been along the ages, should be revealed, made manifest. It should be at that time. Amen. And he did it. Amen. His words don't fail. Isn't that a mysterious thing? God drawing in the heavens. The same thing that the whole same God let me draw on the blackboard. And then by himself, that's three times he's perfectly identified it. And just before the Pope goes in uh, to Jerusalem, which that was the church. The moon is the church, represents the church, and before the church, the shadow of the world crosses the moon. And the shadow of worldlyism. Amen. The shadow of worldliness, worldly church, has swept across 
to black out the entire life of the Bible. The world got in the light of the reflection. Do you understand? The world crossed in the light of the moon and blinded out the sun. And the reflection of the moon that's supposed to be giving light to the earth, it was blacked out. And it come in and draw the pictures just exactly like it did by inspiration before it happened. Amen. Now that, was, I believe Sister Simpson was a Tucson paper. Uh, I don't know if Sister Simpson, she didn't understand it then. She said, I cut out some pictures for you and some notes out of the paper and handed it to me. And I thought something strange. I went in there and picked it up and looked at it. And I said, there it is. Just exactly. See? Just what I've been looking for. And there it was in the paper. Sister Simpson might tell you what paper it's in if you want to get a copy of it. And, and what say? Evening edition of December the 28th. See, before he went to Jerusalem to block out his light or what access it does have, what time, position, and what rights it has to shine, now it's cutting it off altogether for the last age, the seventh church age, where she goes into darkness. What a great thing the Lord is telling us. And everything, it's never failed. But what God in the heaven has declared it Amen. and told it, looked to it, and here's identified it and vindicated it, that it is the absolute truth. Amen. Darkness. This lady will see a church age. Now, when Jesus, which is the Word, in the Lady of Sea of Church Age was on the outside of the church, Amen. knocking at the door, trying to get in. Amen. Darkness, gross darkness upon this people. Was the Bible right? Amen. The perfection of the Scripture. Glory of His great name. The Pope's visit was a sign of the churches. Blackening out His manifested, uh, the, the manifested light of the world was the Bible. Jesus said He was the light of the world. The Bible said that He is the Word. Amen. And the manifested or the vindicated Scripture is the light. Amen. And now you'll not be permitted to do it when this takes a hold. And we've seen it foreshadowed, told by inspiration before it happened, foreshadowed by the moon and shows it happened, and here it is taking place. Amen. The hour is upon us. Darkness, gross darkness. Gross darkness on the people now. That's what it is. What does it all mean? Where are we standing? What hour are we in? How close are we to the coming? Well, they say when all they have a revival, fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. All right. What does it mean? God has begun to separate the light from the darkness. See? Pressing it behind, like He did in the beginning, <clears throat> to show the dawn of a new day. The church ages are fading out. <clears throat> Pardon me. The church ages are fading out. God is pressing the darkness into a place that has to do it to fade out. The church organizations Amen. fade out the world. The world is covering the thing over and worldlyism has tucked the whole thing. Yeah. Then isn't God right by worldly things and worldly dressing and worldly acting and worldly living? Amen. It's the world. Ye are not of the world, little children. Amen. You are of heaven. Amen. This is not your home. Amen. Why should I look to us older people try to look back and get young again? We can't do that. But we're looking forward. Amen. Not looking back, looking here. Amen. What has been, we want to know what's going to be. Amen. And we're looking for that hour. Pressing for it. So many good, sincere people today are caught away in these creeds, these churches and organizations having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. 
As Second Timothy, the third chapter says so. Gross darkness, blinding of Israel was for the lightning of the Gentiles. Amen. Now the blinding of the Gentiles is the lightning of the Israel. Amen. It's just like the day and night. One side has got darkness, the other side's got light, and then the light comes over on the other side. Amen. So the the moon passing the way it did in the reflection of the darkness of the world, blinding out its light, is a reflection to us that the Gentile church age is finished. Amen. The church is making herself ready, been making herself ready for a time. It's time for the rapture. For darkness is fading upon the Gentiles, and dawn will soon break upon the Jews. The sun has traveled from the east to the west, and we're on the west coast. The light can only do one thing. Go back east on the other side. You understand, do you? The light can only go back east again to where it began at, Israel. God blinded them for a while, but the, the darkness now is pressed upon the Gentile world that's covered the whole thing. The Gentiles will trod down Jerusalem until Amen. the Gentile dispensation will be finished. Jesus said so. Amen. And now it's finished. Amen. Gross darkness upon the people. God reflecting it in the skies as He has shown it on earth before it all happens. We're in it. Good people caught in this thing. Good people. Sincere people. Like Mary and Joseph, they were very sincere, see, Amen. thinking he was with them when he wasn't. Amen. Mary and Joseph, you know, when they're up to the feast, Jesus, the age of 12, they thought, presuming he was with them, but he wasn't. Good people today think the same thing. They, these people are organizing this council of churches. These people in these organizations... They, they think they're doing a good thing. They're presuming he's with them when they're not. Amen. See, many people think that he was with them when they shook hands with the preacher and put their name on the book, but he wasn't. Amen. Many people thought when they were uh, uh, sprinkled, confirmed, baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, thinking he was with them. They're good people. Yeah. Mary and Joseph are good people. But the facts was he wasn't there. Amen. Don't presume anything. What is life? The vindicated, spoken word of God. Amen. Outside of that, there's no life. Amen. See? You can't lighten the earth with flashlights. Amen. It takes God's word that's made manifest the sun. They were good people. No the accuracy of his word. How perfect it is. Did you notice what Mary said? Now to you, dear Catholic people, I have nothing against you. I have nothing against you. It's a system that you're in. And you Protestants, the same thing. It's a system. Mary, mother of God, Find out a 12-year-old boy of her own son had to set her in order. There's not one time in the Bible where Jesus ever called Mary his mother. She wasn't his mother. Amen. How could she be a mother of God? Amen. She was only a womb Amen. that he used to come to the earth to be manifested to the earth through the womb. There's nothing to her at all. Not one scripture ever said mother. Notice how Mary's so wrong, but his word's so perfect. Amen. She said to him when she found him in the temple at 12, discussing with the theologians, he was astounded at them as a 12-year-old boy, not even in school. Or if it is, we have no record of it. But a 12-year-old lad confounding the, the sages in the temple, that is wisdom. Amen. Amen. She said, Thy father and I have sought thee with tears. Thy father, the mother herself, supposedly, 
said, Thy father, Joseph, and I have sought thee with tears. What did he say to her? Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? Amen. If he'd been about Joseph's business, he'd been making houses or in a carpenter shop. Amen. But he wasn't Joseph's son. Amen. I'm about my father's business. Amen. Correcting these denominations and creeds and things Amen. I hear. I'm about my father's business. He never admitted Joseph was his father. But Mary did. And he turned back around and straightened her out. Amen. She said, your father and I have sought you. He said, I'm about my father's business. Showing Joseph wasn't his father. His Amen. words are perfect. Amen. See? But Mary and them, just presuming that, well, see what it was? She got carried away. Amen. She, she, got, she wanted to show before these priests and things that, uh, that she wasn't uh, the type of woman. Uh, and she, in doing that, she absolutely tore the foundation out from under her testimony. Amen. After she had testified that an angel had come to her and said, Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, knowing no man, a virgin-born son, and here before the high Sanhedrin, she says, Joseph, your father here, and I have sought you. And that 12-year-old boy said, I'm about my father's business. He rebuked her. That isn't my father. See the church today? Carried away with counsels and, and things of the world. Amen. Now she's blacked out. Amen. God's rebuking her. Amen. Never did Jesus ever call her mother. One day... She came to visit him at his meeting in a house, something like this. Someone comes, said, outside the door there, your mother and brothers wait for you. He said, who is my mother? Amen. My brothers. Who are they? Looked around upon his disciples and said, they that do the will of my father is my mother, my brother, my sister, so forth. That's who it is. And at the cross, when he was dying... He said to John, the young disciple, he said, Behold thy mother. Amen. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. See? Never claimed himself. It wasn't her son. It was God's son. Amen. She was just the womb. This is a house this morning. But it's not the church. Amen. The church is in you. Amen. Christ. Amen. The spirit of the mortals is sitting here met together in heavenly places. Amen. It's Christ, not the house. The house is all right. It's serving its purpose. But it's only used for a meeting place. Amen. Mary was only a womb that he used to come to the earth to be identify himself amongst the people. Not the mother of God. No more than this house is a church of God. It's just used for that. Yeah, many friends think now, people, good people like Mary and Joseph think that, that he's with them in doing this. But as they were then, so are they now. Mistaken. They thought they was with him, but there wasn't. But uh, when they was baptized, people might thought, oh, I, I received him when I accepted him, was baptized. That isn't it. The spoken word reflects itself. But the elected, what about the light? Now, I've been talking so much on the dark, and I've got half my time up, 11.30. Now, let's turn it back around. Gross darkness is up on the people. Now, what about the light? He said gross darkness would be up on the people, but there would be... Light, rise and shine, for the light has come. Amen. How can there be darkness and light? It's got to be separated. Amen. And only one thing separates it, the Word. Amen. Manifested. Amen. Separates. It presses it to the other side. Of the world. Here's the darkness on the earth. But when the manifested Word of God, the Son, which was spoken into existence by the Word, shows itself, darkness runs to the other side. Amen. And that's what's taking place now. Amen. Darkness separating itself from the light. 
Now to the electric church in this dark hour, which we could stay on that for hours, but I think I've said enough that you understand what, I'm, what the Scripture means when I said gross darkness upon this people. Now I say to the church, Shalom. Hey, God's peace. Peace. Ever true Hebrew when he meets another, Shalom. In other words, good morning. God be with you. God's peace go with you. It's a good morning. How do you do? It's breaking day. Church. It's darkness upon the people, but it's good morning to the church. Christ is appearing among us. Shalom. Peace. Hallelujah. Shalom. When we see darkness settling, darkness just before day, we know that the morning star is hanging out to introduce the coming sun. Amen. It's that's when the morning star shines. It's, uh, it's, it's the going between. It's always darkest just a few minutes before day. Amen. The blackout comes. The moon fails to shine. The darkest before day is because the light is pressing the darkness. Amen. But the morning star comes out and says, Good morning. Amen. Shalom. Amen. That's him among us, his word being identified. Amen. Shalom. The great day is fixing to break. When the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Our names are on his book. We'll be there. Shalom. Good morning. Peace be unto you. The darkness is separating itself from the light. God's causing it. The lights are doing it. Amen. See, the lights press itself in such a way until the darkness has to congregate together. Amen. They've had a chance to accept it and they wouldn't do it. Amen. So it's condensed itself. Amen. And they do that by the putting the church together in the council of churches and united with the pagan darkness. Amen. When they so firmly disagree with one another, but yet they had to go together to make the night come upon the people. Isaiah 6 and 1 says, Arise and shine, for the light has come to you. Rise and shine. The light has come. <laughs> the word light is vindicated again. The light vindicated again God's Word so that you can see God manifested in His promise of the light of the day or the Word given to this age. Amen. See? These promises is made for this day. These promises that were said by the prophets and by Jesus Himself. In this day, God in sundry times, Hebrews 1, God in sundry time and divers manners spake to the fathers and the prophets but in this last day, to His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The great light that hung in the wilderness, which was at Moses forsook Egypt, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater treasures than that of Egypt. Amen. The same one that met Saul on the road down to Damascus. A great light hung before him. That same light, same pillar of fire. Saul, being a Hebrew, would never worship any spirit in there or call it Lord. In the position he was in, he said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, I come from God and I go to God. That same light has come. Amen. To what? To manifest. Amen. To, to make known to the people Amen. the promises that he's made for this day. Amen. Manifested light of the day. The darkness is darkened. When he comes, he was the light of the day. There was supposed to come a Messiah. And he came just exactly like God said he did. Amen. Would come. And when he did, what was he? The light of the day. Amen. And it pressed the darkness so against him. Amen. Is that right? Amen. He had to give his life that the light continue could shine. Amen. He was the light of the day. But why? Why was he the light of the day? He was the vindicated word Amen. that had been spoken, made manifest. Amen. No more than God said over this dark, gloomy, dismal, musty world that stood here without light. He said, let there be light. Amen. And it wasn't light. 
until that word was manifested. Amen. That was light. Amen. He said, there will come a Savior, a Messiah. Amen. It still wasn't manifested until he come to manifest that promise. Amen. And when he vindicated that promise, he said, search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify on me. Amen. They said, we well, you know not when thou comest. We are Moses' disciples. He said, if you were Moses' disciples, you'd know me, for Moses wrote of me. Amen. He was the manifestation. He was the vindication of the spoken word of God by Moses. Amen. And today, that we're now living in, God has come on the scene to vindicate and prove His promises. Amen. Amen. So it's the light of the hour so we can rise and shine. Amen. The light shines upon us again today. The Word is being made manifest. It's the light. It's like that light shining out there, the sunshine this morning. That's God's spoken Word. Amen. There's nothing else can give light like that. There's nothing can do it. Amen. Any artificial light burns out in a little bit and bulbs and everything else, but that never fails. Amen. For it's a spoken word of God Amen. made manifest. Little denominational creeds will bust above and blow above and knock a fuse and everything else. Amen. But the word of God shall never fail. Amen. It'll be itself always the word. I'm afraid I'm going to run over time a little bit here. Or, uh, or, it's all right. Go ahead and finish this message. Amen. All right. Rise and shine, for the light has come to you. The word light is vindicated. The only way as God was, Jesus Christ, was the manifestation of God's spoken word, the light of the hour. John the Baptist was the light of the hour. Amen. He was the light before Jesus was light. Amen. The prophet Isaiah said... A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight his path. That was a spoken word of God. He was laying there. He hadn't come to life yet. Malachi, the last prophet, 400 years before it taking place, he said, Behold, I send my messenger before me to prepare the way of the Lord. Here come one out of the wilderness, without denomination, without creed, without identification. Amen. But his light identified him. Amen. The Word identified him. Amen. They said, Are you the Messiah? He said, I'm not. But I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Amen. Prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You did walk in his light. He was a bright and shining light for a while. Why? Until the way was prepared. Amen. Then his light went out. Amen. You can't walk in that light, you Baptist. Amen. This is the light of the hour. Amen. The light has come. Rise and shine. The word light, the, word, the manifested word of God identified is a light. Now, what about the new year that we're facing? We could have more to say on this in between, from the darkness to the light, the introducing of the light coming between. But now, <clears throat> we won't get right straight to the new year. All right. New year. New year. What about it? Brings new hope. We're one year closer. We're one day closer than we was yesterday. We're one hour closer than we was when I started. 15, 15 minutes to 11 is 15 to 12 now. We're one hour closer. We don't look back. We look forward. See? Amen. Oh, yes, sir. New year doesn't mean turning a new page. No. Like the man one morning, I was heard it. And a man got up early and went out and picked up the paper. Come back, sit down, put his feet up on the divan, put his glasses on, begin to read the paper. His wife out getting breakfast, she said, John, anything new? I said, nope. Same old thing, just new people. <laughs> That's right. Murders, rape, and everything. Somebody else done it, see. <laughs> True. Not turn a new page. Turn to the Word. See what the Word promises for today. See what the light of the day is supposed to be. What we are to do this year is not go back to creeds and things. Go back to our old denominations. Not go back to old denominations, but turn to the Word. Amen. See what kind of a light is supposed to shine today. 
Go, church, turn to the Word. Get back to the Word. Flip the right switch. Amen. Quit punching around on electric lights. Amen. See? Artificial man-made. Turn to His Word and see the promise of today. And then see what the promise is and watch for its identification. When it's vindicated, then you know where you're in light or not. See what the promise is. Change in the pages or change in calendars doesn't change time. A lot of people say, well, the old year's gone. Throw away the old December calendar now. Put up the other one. A new year, that's, that's what New Year's means to them. To me, I want to see what's promised for today. I want to know what the light of the hour is so I know how to walk in it. I want to know where I'm living, what age I'm in, how far up the road am I. As Paul said, I stand quoting again, forgetting those things that are in the past, now I press towards the mark, the high calling, to the complete identification when all time will fade out into eternity when Jesus comes. Do as David did. Put your future into his hands. Don't look to anything else, but put your... David said here, he said, uh, said, my time is in his hands. You notice here in the Psalms where we read it in 62? My time is in his hands. He is my rock. Amen. What is he? He is revealed to me. Amen. He is the revealed truth. Amen. My time is in his hands. Amen. Oh, my. There they are. My time belongs to him. I am his. I'm in his hand because he holds the time. Amen. I don't know what the future holds, but I know he holds the future. Amen. So he who holds the future holds me. Amen. So why should I think about setting forth this or the other for the new year? I just put myself in his hand. Walk like David did. My time is in his hand, knew that God helped the future. David didn't know what the future was, but he knew God had the future. I don't know what the future is. None of us do, but we know he holds the future. Patience. <laughs> Patience. Some of us get so... Um, some of us get in such a hurry. I think a many a good man has done that. You get in too, ma- too much of a hurry. You want to see, you want to do it yourself. And minister, brethren, you know from the way I'm talking, you just listen to this tape. I'm talking to you. Not only the little congregation here, but man around the world. Many men go out impatient, but believing at the time is near, you try to do something within yourself. Wait upon the Lord. Patience is virtue. If you can have patience, it's virtue. It's virtue if you, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. Not they that try to get ahead of the Lord. They that try to tell the Lord, Lord, I know you want me to do this and glory to God. I'm, don't do that. Wait upon the Lord. The Bible said they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God took Thousands of years to fulfill his promise of a coming Savior. But remember, he knowed at all time when it was coming. Amen. There were many people rose up and tried to be messiahs. Amen. Many churches tried to produce messiahs. But God had the time set for his messiah. Amen. He was no hurry. Amen. See? In doing the time of this, he showed many types of messiahs. He showed it all the way from Adam to the Messiah. Amen. First and last Adam. Amen. One of them of the world and the other of heaven. One earthly and the other heavenly. One come down from heaven, the other come off the earth. But promised a Messiah. He took thousands of years to fulfill it. Showed in Joseph exactly what he was. Joseph portrayed him. David portrayed him. When David was a rejected king, went up on top of the hill and looked back and wept over Jerusalem... As a rejected king, that was Jesus in David. 800 years later, stood up on Jerusalem as a rejected king. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've hovered you as a hen does her brood, but you would not. Look at Joseph, born among his brethren, the patriarchs. 
Not the last one, next to the last one. Benjamin was the last one. But just before it, the last. Amen. See? Just before it. Hated of his brothers, loved of his father. He was hated because he was a spiritual man. He could interpret dreams. They were exactly right. Amen. He could see visions, foretell things that would happen. And they hated him. Amen. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. What did they hate Jesus for? They called him Beelzebub because he was the Word, and the Word can discern the thoughts that's in the heart. Amen. They hated him. And they sold him for 30 pieces of silver. He was sold into a pit, Joseph was, supposing it to be dead. His bloody coat was left behind, like Jesus' bloody garment that was taken up from the cross, the robe that he wore, to identify his death. But what did God do to Joseph? He brought him up out of the pit. Amen. Set him at the right hand of Pharaoh. And no man could see Pharaoh, only see Joseph. And when Joseph left the palace, trumpets blowed. Amen. And a proclamation went forth. Every knee bow. Amen. Joseph is approaching. Same thing, Jesus. He was taken from the pit, supposedly, where he was dead and raised up and set at the right hand of the majesty. No man has seen God at any time but the only begotten of the Father. And when he leaves there, the trumpets will sound and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Amen. He's a prince of prosperity. Look what Egypt done then. It saved the whole world. The drought come on. So so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. The knee, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to him being. He was all showed in times. But God knew exactly when he would come. Amen. He knew exactly when he'd come. No matter how many they had before that, he had his Messiah. Amen. He showed them in types what was coming. Just exactly like he showed us in seven church ages. What would come? Just exactly what he showed us what would come when he set that light up there in Revelation to it to show the world. When he sent the seven angels to reveal the seven messengers that had been down through there and show the loose ends, each angel coming each day and revealing the loose ends that Luther left and Wesley left and Pentecost left. Amen. It's all represented in there. And in the very type and shadow of the great Shalom. Yeah. Amen. Jehovah, Yahweh. See. Exactly. Throw it in the skies and there's a mechanical eye Taking a picture of it. Amen. Thank the Lord. Shalom. Amen. Peace. Amen. Don't be weary. Jesus is here. His great Amen. light has come to us and we're thankful for it. Amen. Yes, His Word, the great mystery. Here He is today, manifesting Himself, doing the same as He did then, just the same, doing the very same thing. Amen. We are creatures of time. He's God of eternity. We try to press ourselves. We try to make something different. Oh, this has got to be done. Remember, He knows all about it. It's going to happen anyhow. Amen. Let Him do it. Just commit yourself to Him. Look up and shine with joy of the Lord to know that you've been privileged, your eyes to come open and see this day. Amen. Trust in Him for the future. You've seen Him vindicate His Word in days past. He that vindicated his word in days past and made all these other things happen just exactly to the hour that we're living. Everything exactly to the seventh angel's message, both showed it in heaven on earth and made it made known three ways. Amen. So there can't be no slip up. Remember, he promised he'd come again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That word will be vindicated. Amen. God's promised word with 2,000 years of waiting, he will arrive on time. Amen. Don't be weary. You'll be here. As he has vindicated his word in every age, the church ages showed the same thing and the revealing it all over with the seventh message and so forth. God revealed it. Amen. Manifested it and proved it. Amen. And, and among us today, he showed himself here with us Amen. and proved and vindicated his word so will he. There will be a millennium. Amen. The old will be young there forever. Sickness will fade away and death will be no more. Amen. They shall build houses. They will inhabit them. They'll plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. They'll not plant in another inhabit. His son take it. His son will be living by him. Amen. He'll not plant in another eats. Die off and somebody else take it. But he'll live there. Amen. 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 The wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and Charles shall lead them around. They'll be... There'll be innocence. There'll be, there'll, be, there'll be nothing to hurt. Amen. We'll be changed from what we are now to that glorious image of the Son of God. 
which is immortal. Years can never touch him. Age can never do anything to him. He's the immortal Son of God. Amen. So we know that uh, we're at the end time. We're at the junction. All these things thoroughly identified. So will it be identified again. Now, the future, he holds it. How do I know when he's coming? When is he coming? I don't know. But he'll be here. Amen. That's right. When will he do thus and thus? When will the curse go off the earth? When will these blessed uh, reflections of God's love, of trees standing here and shining out in the flowers and things, when will they immortal grow? I don't know, but they will. Yeah. When will all the reflection of man's heart's desire to live in hospitals and doctors and operations and crying and grief, when will it all cease? The glorious reign with Jesus of a thousand years of shalom. Amen. When will it? I don't know. He said it would be there. Amen. I don't know how he's going to do it, but his spoken word will be vindicated when the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. And the healing part there will not be a physical healing as you think, as saying somebody's got a sickness and it'll be taken away from him. That's what he's doing now in Amen. type. Amen. But the whole creature will be changed. Amen. This mortal will take on immortality. Amen. This old age will jump into youth. Amen. Amen. Well, how will it be? I don't know, but it will be there. Amen. I'm getting old myself. This year, if the Lord lets me live to see 6th of April, I'll be 55 years old. An old man. But I'm not looking. I don't want to go back and be a boy again. I want to Amen. press towards that mark. Amen. For what purpose I came for. Amen. About 30 something years now I've stood behind this desk from a little boy but 20 something years old about 21 22 years old I tried to proclaim this message and every ounce of my strength I put to it and my shoulders stoop and my hair turns gray and falls out I don't look back to that and come to it again Amen. I'm looking yonder to the break of a day for the vindicated word of God said not one hair of your head shall perish and I'll raise it up again at the last days Amen. How's he going to do it? I don't know. But I trust the, the new year. I don't know what it holds, but I know he holds it. Amen. That's the hopes of the new year I have. Amen. If he comes, amen. amen. If he doesn't come, I'll still be working if he spares me. Amen. I just trust the future to him. I don't know what it is. I just trust it to him. You've seen him vindicate his word, so you know it's going to be done. His word. You say, Brother Brown, how do you get that? Well, let me give some thought here just a minute. Do you know what a sympathy is? I know you do. It's a music. That's a drama. See, they act it out. Now, you little children, so you'll understand. You remember in, uh, in school, I believe you have, uh, what is that little Russian sympathy? Sometimes they, they act out on the drums. You know, it's called, uh, isn't it the little, about the, the little woodpecker, you know, and guy under the woods, and they had the fluttering, the beating on the drums and things. And you hear it all as you go through the symphony, as they play it. Uh, I forget the name of that. Peter and the, and the Wolf. That's right. Peter and the Wolf. Now, that's a, that's a Russian sympathy. See, they don't, they don't have little, little figures flying around playing out, but they play it on drums. And then and make the drums and the sounds and things, it plays it out, it acts it, so you understand what Brother Bram's trying to say. <laughs> now to you adults, the Scripture is God's sympathy. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All the composer knows what it really means. Amen. And he reveals it to those who are listening, Amen. who are interested in knowing what the drama is. Amen. But you have to know about a sympathy first. See, it's not just something you see. It's the, the changing, the junctions of the word, uh, of the music. It throws sometimes it's going this way for a while, a certain beat. After all, it changes all around. Amen. What is it? To you who wouldn't understand it or don't know nothing about it, not interested in it, it's just a racket. Amen. It's a fuss. Yeah. Amen. But to those who know about it, they're watching for it. Yeah. Amen. They know it's coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we have these times of sympathy, of the sympathy of God's Word. The, the whole drama changes. Amen. 
You who are interested, listen for that change. You know it's getting close. You hear the way the drums are beating? Amen. Amen. What's that to happen? Yeah. You know this is a change. Yeah. See? It's going to break out into a burst in a few minutes. See? Amen. You're watching for it. You can tell the way the drums are timing. Oh, God. If you can hear the drums of the finish now. If you can hear the echo of the music. Of the heavenly word is singing itself out. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Amen. The sympathy of God's great drama that he's playing. He changes in his sympathy at the junctions. The composer and those who are interested listen for the change. That's what all this stuff is to us. We're listening, we're watching. Every time he appears, something happens. We see the time getting close. We see the, back in our, not long ago when that church ages was being drawn out. We were listening. We see it was right with the word, Amen. beating with the word. After a while, what happened? Carry come himself Amen. and vindicated him. We heard the word say that in the days of the seventh angel, in the church age, it just said the seventh angel's message would be the last message. And then what we find out over here in Revelation 10, in the days of the message of the seventh angel, the mysteries of God should be finished. Amen. The seventh seal would be pulled back. Amen. It should be there. Amen. And all at once was happening, a vision broke. Said, go to Tucson. Amen. A great noise will take place at this time, so you'll be thoroughly understanding. And know it's sent. It'll just shake the earth nearly. All of you know about it. It's on tape months before it happened. That happened! Amen. There appeared in the skies. Shalom. Amen. Amen. What is it? It's a changing beat, the sympathy. Then one time he said about the third pull. How it would come by this one way, then by knowing the heart, and then the spoken word. Amen. Jesus said, greater things than this will you do, for I go to my Father. John 14, the works that I do shall you do also greater than this, for I go unto my Father. Just as I said a while ago, when Mary tried to identify him as Joseph's son, he corrected her. Amen. His words cannot fail. He said so. Heavens and earth will fail, but my words will not. Amen. When we hear the sympathy beating, changing, fixing the change, it's a junction time. We notice as he began to, to beat, and we've seen the works that I do, shall you do also. And greater shall you do. <coughs> greater. He promised it. Amen. We wondered how it could be. But did you notice? When he performed his first miracle, he took water and turned it into wine. Is that right? Amen. He took water, which potentially someday might have been wine, Amen. but it was water first. And when he fed 5,000, what did he do? He took something that had been like water. He took a fish that once swam Amen. and was born from an egg. And he broke it, and another fish growed on to the creation that was the original creation. Amen. He took bread that was once wheat and was a seed and become bread. And he broke from this bread, and the creation only multiplied. Amen. But in the woods, there was nothing there to make a squirrel. Amen. Let there be, and there was, without anything to break it from. Amen. What is it? The same Jesus Christ. Amen. Greater things than this will you do, Amen. for I go to my Father. Not take something that's been created, break something from it, and multiply creation, but absolutely create. Showing that he's the same Jehovah that stood back there and said, Let there be, and there was. Amen. His word was made manifest. Amen. When he was made flesh on earth, he took his original creation, broke it back, and multiplied it. But now in the last days, when he comes down among us again, the same light that moved down and said, Let there be light. Amen. Amen. He just speaks the creation into existence. Amen. Greater than this will you do, or I go to my Father. Remember, we're at these times and the world don't understand because it's a bunch of nonsense because they're not Methodists. The Methodists don't understand it. 
Because it's, it's, it ain't the Baptist. The Baptists don't understand it. Amen. Because it's not Catholic. The Catholic don't understand it. Amen. Because it's not Pentecostal. The Pentecostal don't understand it. Amen. But those who wait upon the Lord, Amen. those who are looking, not one man, we have history of any observatory knowing that star that passed over. But the wise men followed Amen. it for hundreds of miles. For two years, they watched it and followed it. See what I mean? To so those who are listening to the sympathy. Remember, the composer knows the end from the beginning. Yes. Amen. He knows all about it. That's the reason he could write it here. Amen. Correctly. Now, you must begin with him. You must begin, if you want to hear a sympathy, you begin with him like in the music at the sympathy. You listen, you know what it says, it's going to be what the sympathy is. Then you begin to listen at the music. And you know what it is, so you know just about here's where certain certain things take place. That's got to change. Now to anybody else that don't know nothing about what they're just walking in, sit down, it's just a bunch of nonsense. Amen. Rattling noise. But the one who knows what it is, it's beat out with the music, jumped out with the notes. It's, it's trumpeted with the trumpets. It's strung on the harp. It's played with the violin. It's, uh, it's uh, beat on the bass. It's sounded by the trumpet. It's beat on the drums. The whole thing together in rhythm. Amen. And it makes the, the drama so you can close your eyes and live in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Man can close his mortal eyes to earthly sight and live in the presence of Jesus Christ Amen. when you see his word being beat out in the great sympathy Amen. that we're living in now, changing. You must begin in the sympathy. The only thing you can do if you're in the sympathy, then you start, you begin to get into the rhythm. That's the way you do God. Amen. You don't stand off and look at it. Amen. You get into the rhythm of it. Amen. How do you get in there? You're born into it. Amen into the rhythm of the Word when you become part of that Word. Amen. You have to become part of the dance to get out of the dance. Amen. You have to become part of the ball game, something you're interested in to get in the ball game. Amen. You have to become part of the Word Amen. to know God's sympathy. Amen. The sympathy is when it's playing. You understand you're marching with the beat of the time. You're watching for it. The works that I do shall you also, greater than this shall you do these last days. Oh, my. The great changing of the time. We'll get into the beat. Beat of the Word. Find His purpose, the hour that we're living. Get into the rhythm of it. How does... How He does it. If you get into the Word, you find out how He did it at the beginning. Amen. Then you know how He's doing it all the time. How did he send his message first? What does he do? He doesn't deal with organizations. He never did. Amen. So he doesn't do it now. So if you're listening to a rhythm of that council of churches, you're in darkness. Amen. But if you're listening to the rhythm of the Word, what did he kill Jesus for? You being a man, make yourself God. Amen. You got my message on the three types of believers. Now that one stood there and it was the make-believers, they followed along for a while making out like they believed. One day Jesus said to them, said, What will you think when the Son of Man, which is from heaven, uh, ascends back into heaven? I come from heaven, going back to heaven. Why, the multitude walked away and said, This is a hard thing. Then there come the make-believers that was walking with him, the 70. When they got something hard, they didn't see, the, they didn't know the sympathy. Amen. They didn't know the promise that this child was Jehovah. Amen. His name shall be called Counselor, Amen. Prince of Peace, the Mighty God. Amen. And when he said, when I ascend up to heaven from where I come from, well, they said, this is a hard thing. Who can understand? We know you're just a man. We eat with you. 
We sleep with you. We're in the woods with you. We're by the waters with you. Well, you're merely a man and say the son of man that goes back up where he comes from. What will you say? This is a hard thing. See? They didn't know the beat. They didn't know the rhythm of the sympathy of God's word, that he was God manifested in the flesh for he was a, a vindicated word light of the hour. Yeah, yeah. They didn't get it. Amen. They said, this is a hard thing. Who can understand this? And they turned away. Yeah. They didn't know the beat. Amen. See? Then we notice again there with Judas, the make-believer or the unbeliever, that waited till he found a fault. Then he turned to the disciples, said, just the twelve. And Judas is one of them. He said, you want to go to then Peter said, who would we go to, Lord? You're the composer. Amen. Amen. You know how it's going on. Amen. You're the only one that has the word of life. Amen. Where could we turn to? We couldn't go back to be a Pharisee or Sadducee or Herodian or whatever it might be. Amen. You're the one that has the word of life. We have no other place to go. We've, we've joined ourselves to this great concert. We are in here. We're listening and we're in the rhythm. We believe that you are the Son of God, Amen. the manifested Jehovah. Amen. We're sure of this. Amen. We don't know what these great trials and troubles and afflictions and things and you saying you're going to be offered up and all this, that, other, and on the third day, all this stuff. We don't understand that, but we're in listening to God's sympathy. We're a part of it. Amen. And we're waiting to see what takes place next. And we're following close with you. Oh, my, that's what I want to do. Promise. How does he begin? Just like he did at the beginning. See? He never did send his message to an organization. Amen. He never sent his group a message. He sent one man. Amen. In the days of Noah, it was Noah. Amen. In the days of Moses, it was Moses. Amen. There's others thought one time that they said, well, you make yourself the only holy man of the bunch. God... Look down upon that. Amen. Moses went to the Lord, I've done this. Well, what must I do? He said, separate yourself from them. Amen. I'll take care of the rest of it. I sent you. It's my responsibility. And he opened up the earth and swallowed up Korah and all the game. Amen. Always. John and Jesus couldn't be the same time. Amen. Jesus, when John looked up, he said, now I must decrease. He must increase. He's the vindicated light. Amen. So will this light move on until he is finally the full vindication comes. Yes. That's Amen. right. That's right. He is as he was at the beginning. That's how you start. How you start learning what God was. Amen. What did he do when he was here on earth? What kind of a life did he live? Did he agree? Was he a compromiser? Did he go to the organizations? How did he identify himself? Search the scriptures. Amen. You think in them you think you have eternal life? And they're the ones that testify of me. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing today or any other time. Amen. When you won't like, see what the Scripture says for this hour. Amen. All right. Where do you begin then? If it's a sinner here, you begin at the cross Amen. where you reckon yourself dead with him. You've entered in then to the, to the great uh, drama. You're listening then. You're watching your sheet as you hold it in your hand, the, the, the sympathy. You've you got a sheet in your hand that would tell you these things where the changes of the music begins to make it act out. Then you see what the act is. When you see God's Spirit fall upon people and do a certain thing, you look back to see where it's at. See if, it's that, if that's the thing for the day. Why, they had to shoot in their hand when Jesus came Amen. of the sympathy. Certainly they did. Am I saying that word right, sympathy? sympathy? I hope so. <laughs> so then um, I just happened to think of it. Sympathy? Sympathy. Is that right? All right. Now, they had a sheet in their hand. But what would they do? They were trying to look back to a beat that had all, a portion had already been played out. Amen. That's what the churches do today. They look Amen. back to see what part Luther played. The Luthers does. They don't know the change of music. Amen. They don't know what God's doing today when he does these things. The Luthers, the Pentecost, they oh, we got it. Amen. You got a sheet that played out 50 years ago. Amen. Amen. Certainly. Let's just keep this word in our hands and watch when the changes come. Then we'll know what we are doing. Now, that begin with him at the cross, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive 
the music, Amen. the direction, see, His Word, the Holy Ghost that manifests the Word. Then follow through with the rhythm of the Word. Whatever the music beats for that hour, beat with it. Amen. Many people ask them, why? And they ask, they ask, sometimes they ask me, why? Why would these things happen? Why, why, why did this happen to me? Why did I start and this happen? And I, I had this trouble here and this upset me here and I lost this year. Sometimes I've asked why. Why, when I was just a young minister and first started out, did God take my wife right out from under me? Take my baby right from beneath me? Right beneath my heart? Why did he do that? I didn't know. I do now. I just held my hand in his and kept trusting. He knows every junction. He knows the rhythm must, when it must take place. He knows what it takes to mold you. He knows what kind of material he's going to use. See? The backside of the desert sometimes is where God molds righteous men into sages and prophets. See? That's where men are beat out. Men are beat out in the Word. When they got all kind of creed and stuff in them, let them come to the Word and God beats it right out of them, molds it right into, this, into the great sympathy with, of His Word. And then they see the Word moving on. God knows when the rhythm of it has got to change. He knows how the rhythm goes. Amen. I don't know how it goes, but He knows. Amen. He knows how it goes. I don't. But I look at it here and I say, well, it's just coming. <laughs> Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers him out of them all. Amen. God has moved through history with the rhythm of the promise of His Word in each age in the same rhythm, making His Word. That's how God moved down through history. From all the way from Genesis to Revelation, He has moved through history with His Word. That's right, with the rhythm of uh, the power of the Holy Spirit vindicating His Word to the elected. Amen. Remember, He's never been able to touch the outside church. Amen. It's only the elected. Look at that priest said, this man is Beelzebub. He's a fortune teller. Why, he, he, he's reading their mind. Little do they know the word is sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. And he Amen. was the word. But this little prostitute standing at the well that day to get a bucket of water, she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. Yes, we know the Messiah is coming. We had prophets for hundreds of years. But we know the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, that's what he's going to be. He said, I'm he. Amen. That was enough. Amen. Why? The rhythm beat out. Amen. She was looking for that change Amen. from a church denomination to a vindicated Messiah. Amen. And here he stood the Messiah that Moses spoke of. The Lord your God shall raise a prophet like unto me. Amen. There he is. The rhythm changed. The vindicated seed recognized it. And when the real Word of God falls upon the vindicated, upon the seed, and they see that vindication of the Word, they recognize it. Amen. They're looking at the Word. They know the junction. They know the time. They know the change. Amen. They know the beat that's supposed to be in that hour. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. They know the beat. They know the time. They know how it's supposed to go. And only the elected knows it. Amen. And Philip saw it. He couldn't stand it any longer. He knew that was Messiah. So he went to a fellow that had Bible study together. Nathaniel, he said, come see the man. Come see what we found. Amen. We have found Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. We found Jesus of Nazareth. That's the prophet that Moses spoke of. Come. We found him. We found him. He said, how can it be? I just, where was he? See, he wasn't stuck. See, he didn't know the rhythm just exactly. They'd been studying. But when he got there, he told him, introduced to him the word, and when he got there, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite. The rhythm began to take hold. Amen. The great drama was being played out there on the platform or on the ground that day. Maybe Jesus standing up on a rock, talking to the people. And when Philip came up with Nathaniel, he looked over to him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you ever know me? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Oh, Amen. my God. He was part of it. Amen. He said, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. No matter what the, the world beats was and all the shindigs they had of the, of the denominations, 
It wasn't that great sympathy of God. Hey, man, he said, Thou art that king of Israel. There you are, I see it. I know it. Why, he was elected. The elected seed knows it. Always through every age. That's, they know it. Say, but Brother Branham, what about my mother and dad? What about my people? What about my denomination? What, what will they do? They'll ca cast me out. Is it? If you can't look ahead, look up. Amen. Don't try to look ahead anyhow. Put your hand in his. Amen. Let him lead you. Amen. Look up. Don't look ahead. You say, why? Well, others make fun of me about my long hair and me taking off shorts and about me leaving the church. <laughs> Suffering for his name's sake is growing pains of his grace. <laughs> yeah. Suffering for his word, see, is growing pains of his grace. <laughs> yes, sir. Just remember, it's the grace of God's been given to you. Oh, my. Like Paul says. Hallelujah. He had an infirmity. Something is bothering him. He, the devil had buffeted him, blow after blow. And he consulted the Lord three times to take it away from him. He said, I don't want this, Lord. Take it away from me. And then one night the Lord spoke to him and said, Saul, or Paul, my grace is sufficient. He said, Now I'll glory in my infirmity. Amen. I'll glory in it. I know you're the healer. I've seen you heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils, Amen. open the eyes of the blind. But if I've consulted you and you tell me it's your grace is sufficient, then this devil that bothers me is, is the growing pains of your grace. Then I'll glory in my infirmities. Why? If, lest I get exalted above the abundance of the revelation. Amen. See, he, say he had something the other disciples didn't have. He saw him after his death, burial, resurrection, ascension. He saw him. Some of them say, well, I walked with him. So did everybody on the street. But after he's dead, buried, rose and ascended up and returned back in the form of a pillar of fire. He talked to Paul. That more than the rest of them had. Amen. He said, except I get exalted and want to build great big seminaries and everything else and great big something and other, lest I get exalted above the abundance of this revelation, God let a messenger of the devil keep me beat down. He said, then when I'm weak, I'm strong. Amen. Amen. Growing pains of grace. Amen. We could stay on that a long time. An hour and 45 minutes has passed. And we're suffering is grace pain. Oh, he may permit crossroads. He may permit crossroads to try us, to perfect us for his service. He may permit that in that church, both here and on tape. He may permit the crossroads for our service, like he did Daniel. He gave Daniel a little crossroads one day. You know, he's a great man down in Babylon. He did. He let the king turn against him and throw him in the lion's den. It only perfected him. Sure it is. He let the Hebrew children go into the fiery furnace. That was determined to stand for his word. He may permit crosswords. Let him laugh at you for having long hair. Let him laugh at you for saying, well, you become a holy roller or whatever more. It may, they, may let you laugh, they may laugh at you for that. that that's all right. That's a crossroad. That's a little junction. That's to prove something. See, the only thing that the crossroad did to the Hebrew children that stood on the Word, it only loosed them from the bands they had around their feet and legs. Amen. And sometimes it takes hard trials to break the bands of the world off of us. Sometimes God lets us have a little trial, you know, to see what we'll do. To take you... Out of the world. Or in other words, let you have a little trial to knock you out of that organization. <laughs> and that idea that the Methodists is the only one, the Baptists or the Pentecostal, or, uh, that's, that's the only group they got. If you don't believe it like my church believe you don't believe it all. Sometimes it lets a little trial happen. Maybe you got a sick baby. Maybe something takes place right at the hour of death. Maybe someone taken from you or something. What's it to do to break you away? Amen. To show you something. Open your eyes. Maybe you come to criticize sometimes. Maybe you listen to this tape just to criticize. Maybe God's doing that to break some of the worldly bands that's got you bound down. Like a drowning man in the river. You have to take the man out of the river before you can get the river out of the man. Amen. That's right. You have to get him out of the river first. Then you get the river out of him. 
Sometimes God has to do it that way. He permits the junctions, crossroads to do that. Stand on His promises, the Word, for they never fail. The future, that's in His hands. Stand like they did. Don't, don't give away. Abraham, at his crossroads, knew that God could raise up his son from the dead from which he received him at the crossroads. Amen. Abraham come to his crossroads. And after he had trusted God and seen all the miracles of God, 25 years he'd wait on a boy, a promised son. And then God told him to go sacrifice the very thing that he'd waited for. My, oh, my. What a time. But did Abraham stagger? Read Romans, the fourth chapter, said he was fully persuaded. Amen. He was fully persuaded of what God had promised God was able to do. Amen. Amen. He permitted the crossroads. Amen. He was showing through Abraham to us. See, he's able to raise the dead. Amen. Abraham said, I received him as one from the dead. Sarah's womb was dead. Sarah's womb was dead, and he, his body was dead. He's an old man. She had no milk veins to feed the baby, and they didn't have, well, there was nothing. And he was sterile himself, and she was sterile. See? There was no way at all. And he received him as one from the dead. And he said, if God can do that, God can raise him up from the dead for the same God Amen. that Amen. told me the baby would come, and I stood and it come. He can raise him from the dead. Amen. For he makes everything work together for the good to them that love him. Amen. Amen. God, who made the promise in the last days these things would happen that we see happen. If he promised the sun and the sun came. If he promised all these things that we see through the scripture and it did. Let's get into the rhythm of it. He promised in the last days these things would take place and we see it. He promised he would send Jesus Hallelujah! Amen. There will be a millennium. There will be a new day. Amen. There will be a day that the sun will never go down no more. For the, we'll need it no more. For the Lamb is the light of the city to where Amen. we're going. Hey, man, the dawning of a new day. I feel it all over me now. Amen. The light of a new day. The light of a day where there is no night. There is no darkness, no shadows, no skies, no, no dim dark skies, no midnights, no graves, no towers on the hillsides, no funeral processions, no doctors, no marge. Hey, man, I, I can feel the, the rays of his light breaking through upon my soul. The new day, the old one's pressing away as I feel the mortal blood pouring through my body. I feel the surge of the Holy Ghost coming behind it. Rise and shine! Something said, Billy Branham, you're getting old. You're getting weak. Your shoulders are dropping. Your hair is turning gray and falling out. That's right in darkness and gross darkness upon the earth. But arise and shine. I feel falling out a surge of light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, which is maybe a new creature in him. I'll look for that day. Amen for the new day. I don't know what the future is. I don't know what it holds. 1964 holds for me or nothing else. But I hold a hand of him that holds eternity. Amen. Who is eternity? Amen. Amen. Abraham knew that God could raise him up again. So he trusted him. So far, the new year, be determined to stay with his word and what it's promised. Amen. Like others elected did in others' days. If you feel that you've seen the light broke through upon you of Jesus Christ, His manifestation of His great Holy Spirit in these last days, and remember, remember, stay with it. What He did, you're one of the elected. And what He the elected in the other days, like Abraham, when He saw it, when it's all against scientific proof, Noah saw it and it's all against scientific proof. Amen. Moses saw it and it's all against scientific proof. These smart ages has gone by, but the elected who saw it, Good term. Amen. 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 And for the future, let's stand firm on the promise. Amen. God made it. It's up to God to see it through. Amen. I'm just following the rhythm. Amen. When it beats down to time, it says, this is the end of William Bram on the earth. Then I'll go with the rhythm. Now rise again with the rhythm. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The one that beat it in, beats it out, beats it in again. It's the rhythm of God. I'll raise him up at the last days. Amen. 
He that believeth on me has everlasting life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. And shall never come into the judgment, but pass from death unto life. I'll follow the beating of the word. Amen. Not the beating of my heart, the beating of the word. No matter what it is, my heart don't beat with the word, then my heart's wrong. Amen. Amen. For he is the word. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us that. God's word. I was listening to a program coming up, Billy and I, a while ago. And it was this uh, a Bible, the, the hour called prophecy, the hour of, what is it called? Something about prophecy, um, voice of prophecy. Really, it's the Seventh-day Adventists. They've had four or five different names. Millerites is what it was to begin with. They was the one that said over there in a meeting that I claim to be Jesus Christ, that uh, the Holy Father was over me, that pillar of fire, and I was Jesus Christ. I had to be a friend of mine standing there at the little meeting. He raised up and said, you'll have to prove that because I'll call him right here. <laughs> I don't want you to see one time that he ever confessed that. See? And like, uh, you talk about the different cults and things on the earth. They know at uh, one time I tithe in with them on this Sabbath question. They got the old day that's passed by. The Holy Ghost is our Sabbath. The Bible says, so, Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy laden. I'll give you Sabbath to your soul. Amen. Not a day. Paul said, you to keep a day, I'm afraid of you. Amen. See, that's right. Amen. Yes, sir. Now, remain the rest, Hebrews 4, to the people of God, a Sabbath keeping. For we which have entered into his rest have ceased from our works as God did from his. Amen. But their speaker, a while ago, nice program. I have nothing against them. I'd do anything I could to help them. Forgive them freely for saying it. Because they did say something that wasn't right. But that's all right. Their doctrine is just like Jehovah Witness and Christian Science and all these other cults, you see. Same thing. But notice, it is like any other organization. There are more wrong guess than the rest of them. The word's always right. Amen. It'll prove itself out right. Notice. But as he was speaking, the man said, We've got the book of the year. This writer, what is his name, the speaker of it? I forget the, just exactly what his name is now. He spoke for the Christian businessman up in Seattle here not long ago at the World's Fair. And um, um, he, uh, he said, this announcer said, this man has wrote the book, the most outstanding book for this year. I disagree. Amen. The book for this year is the Bible. Amen. It's the light of the world. It's God himself. Amen. Our book of the year is the Bible. Amen. For this 1964, our book is the Bible. And all the years to come, our book is the Bible. All years is past. It's been the book of the years past, the book of the years to come, and it's the book of eternity. Amen. It reveals it is God. Amen. Yes, it reveals God. Every year that is to come, it's the book of the year. When, whenever you hear the Bible say anything, its promise is vindicated. There will come an eternal someday. The Bible is the one who gives us this promise. When you hear the Bible say that there's coming a day when Jesus will come. And as I say today now, i got to close because I've been here two hours. See, right at it. Look, if, if the Bible tells us of these things that is to come, speaks of all these hours that if we pass through, the days of Noah, is predicted. The days of all these others, the Scripture predicted. The days of Martin Luther was predicted. The days of Wesley, the days of Pentecostal. This hour that we're living in was predicted. Everything happened just exactly the way it was. Then when, what is it? It's the spoken Word of God, which is vindicated by God, makes it the light of the hour. Amen. See, just like the sun is. When the Word, the Word itself, is the light when it's vindicated for the time that it belongs to. And it's vindicated, then it's the light of the hour. John was the light of... He, he was more light than Elijah and them had. Elijah, he wasn't Elijah's light, but he was Elijah in another form, Amen. vindicating the light. Amen. See? He was, and when Jesus came, he said, he was a bright and shining light for a season. You love to walk in his life. See, and John said, now, I must dim out. I must go out now. My light's finished shining. I must go out. 
he must increase. He's the light. He said, I am the light of the world. Amen. Amen. That's right. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's still the light of the world. And what is he? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Why was he the light of the world? If he come said he was Messiah, and he didn't do like the Bible said the Messiah would do, then he wasn't the light of the world. Amen. See? It's the vindicated word that makes it the light of the world. Amen. And in this hour that we're living in now, the vindicated word of this hour, Pentecost, which you say, speaking in tongues and so forth, that was the day of Pentecost. Amen. That was the light of the hour then. Amen. This is another day. Amen. It's the light of the hour today. The seventh church age. All smothered out with Christ on the outside. The moon identifying it. All the darkness coming up on the earth. The light pressing in now. Begin to show what's going to take place. The thing will be destroyed. And the light will come in and destroy it. And the saints shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. The earth, the moon darkness will be tucked away. The darkness of the night will pass away. The darkness with their death and creeds and away from the word of God, perverted things that they're saying, and the light will break forth upon the day. And remember, when the full Bible, listen in closing, when this full Bible has been thoroughly vindicated, then there will be an eternal shalom. Amen. Eternal peace. See, he come and said he was peace on earth, goodwill towards man, but the world didn't receive it. See, See? he was peace to everyone that come to him for peace. See, peace on earth, goodwill to man. He was the peace at that new year, beginning, new day of God. For why? He was the vindicated light of that day. See, but there's more word to be vindicated. He's got to vindicate more word. And when the last word is vindicated, is vindicated rather, then death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Amen. The millennium will set in. Amen. And it will be one great peace. Shalom. Amen. Let's live for that day, brother and sister. For that one great shalom. Remember, the Bible is the fountain of all wisdom and holds all hopes of the future Amen. to the church shalom let us pray little group present here now I, i've been two hours on, on this little new year's message You've been very patient. Is there one in here this morning, or, or this afternoon rather, that doesn't have shalom, that peace that spoke, that identified Word of God when you and the Word become one, when if the Bible says one thing and you say, no, I can't hardly believe it, that's right, then you haven't shalom. You're not at peace with God because His Word says one thing and you disagree with it. If the word says, shalom, peace, and you have that peace, that every word that God says, you can punctuate it with an amen, and you believe it. And when you see it vindicated, you say, amen, that is the word. But does a creed, a light, a false light, the world sweep across in the shadow of the light that's being reflected to darken it out? Some creed that say, no. Uh, I think that, uh, that that was for something else. That don't mean just that. And yet the Word says it. Are you following that shadow or are you appearing with that light? Here and in the tape, whoever will listen at it, think it over just a moment. And if there's one present here that would like, that doesn't have that light, would you raise your hand to identify yourself that you're ready to walk in that light today? And if there's one out in the land of where this tape shall go, that you don't have it, will you raise your hand to God right where? Turn off your recorder just in a moment when we pray. Get down on your knees and say, Lord God, I've doubted. I have did this. I've thought, well, because the church said them things couldn't be and this wouldn't be. And, 
But I see it's promised in the Bible, and I see too many things. The heavens even declared it itself. And these things that are said are happening just exactly, and God in heaven is declaring the same thing. So I want to receive it now. Let the Word of God come into me. And let me get into the rhythm of not listening to what the church or the preacher says, but let me get into the rhythm of the Word and see what it says. And let it bring to me in this great sympathy of God a beating out of His will in my life. Our Heavenly Father, we now bring to You every hand that's up everywhere and let the Holy Ghost of God bring to them the rhythm of the Word and its truth, that they are to be molded now into sons and daughters of God, and they are to be the reflecting of the light of God upon the earth. They are to be the manifested Word that men and women are to live the way Jesus lived, and to, to believe every word of God and live by it like He did. For He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Not just a few of the words, part of the words, but by every word proceeding out of the mouth of God. The word of Moses' time did not work in the days of Jesus' time. The word, the word in the days of the apostles does not work in this day. It's a promised word for this day. They said themselves and spoke it by the Holy Ghost what would take place in the last days how the churches would be heady, high-minded, how the whore would rise up and the harlots would be right with her, and how the, they would darken the earth and the last church age, the Lady of Sia, Jesus would be completely taken from the church. Oh, Lord, let me stay with Him, the Word, manifest His light through all of us as we set forth in this new year with a determination not knowing what this new year holds, but we are holding to Him the Word that knows the whole uh, sympathy from the beginning to the end. He knows every move and every junction. And Lord, we're just watching Him, keeping our eyes on Him, the Word. And then when we see these things appear, we know that we're right in the rhythm of the Word. Grant it, save every lost soul, Lord, that hear and everyone that hears the tape we commit them to thee for thy kingdom's sake in jesus christ's name amen i was uh, happy to be with you all this morning sorry i've just been exactly since starting exactly two hours from a quarter to eleven to a quarter to one I told me, I said, I'll be back for 1.30. <laughs> uh, we don't believe in breaking speed laws. I don't think we should do that <laughs> to do it. Now, we thank you. I want to say now, Terry turned his tape recorder off because that's the one tape that goes out. I think you still got yours on, which is all right. Call them will speak to the church. I certainly appreciate you all down here. And there's lots of times I think this is a little retreat for me. To come down here on the back side of the desert, as I call it, come back to the desert, way back up in here, and look around, see this little group out here on the trees right beside the, the river. <laughs> and uh, we're on the east side of the river now. <laughs> and I, I, I trust that God will bless you, each and every one. God, shalom, be with you. That's his peace. And I'm sorry, really, to help you like this, but just to get a tape of this now, um, uh, if the Lord willing, this is what I'm going to speak on at, uh, at Phoenix Sunday afternoon, and that Monday I'm going to those sharp meetings and so forth. I'm purpose in the heart this year, if the Lord willing, I, I just cut and tore from side to side, and we all know that the identification, we know what the third pole is, we all we all understand that, and you've got you have the tape. And now I think it'll just lay dormant for a little while until the great hour of persecution comes on. That's when it'll, it'll speak. It'll be manifested in the light of five straight times without the Savior perfectly. And now I think just wait. Just see what 
telling you now, I'm going back to Spain again, through and through, to find out short meetings, and we'll try to have, get out every night early, have just like 30 minutes to talk on something about divine healing or something like that. And whenever I get ready to make a tape again, I'll either run down here to the back side of the desert, or up to the tabernacle or somewhere where we can make a tape, or we'll be among ourselves, and I can try to say what I wish you like that. But, see, Jesus, remember, See, I have to watch when I see that people just completely, irritably walking away. I think I've tried to express it this morning. It's gross darkness upon them. They can't help it. I forgive them, see, for not listening and seeing the things that God has done, and still they don't do it. I still pray God forgive them. And I mean it from my heart. Don't say that because my master said it. But uh, I want to feel in my heart first that I really do. I don't isolate myself from people. I don't want to do that to you because I'm a, I'm, I have a message for them. Salvation. I have to go out among them. See, now I go out with the Trinitarians, with Methodists, Baptists, Lutherans, Pentecostal, Seventh-day Adventists, and everything else because I'm seeking to save that which is lost, if I can, to bring it in to show them the light. And the Lord be with you. I had a, a, our first little group of meetings here. I don't know where you have them enough to schedule here. If some of you I leave it laying here, Pastor Reed for you, where we're to be at. And if the Lord willing, that is the Lord willing I have no leading for them. Just simply going out to try to do whatever I can. And if you got any loved ones around in there would like to come to one of the meetings, why well, you write them a letter and tell them to attend one of these meetings. God bless you. Nice seeing you, Brother Stricker and Sister Stricker and all the rest of you people here. I, some of them I don't even know your names, but uh, I know you by the witness of the Holy Spirit that you're my brothers and sisters, and, and my love and respect is for you. And it's such a great pleasure to be out here with you. And I know now you you had your dinner set here, going to have a little fellowship dinner. We wish it possible I could stick around, and, and I know it's good. I, I know you got the best cooks in the country. <laughs> I know that's right. But I'll probably have to get mine on a hamburger going up. But anyhow, I've got an appointment. Uh, I have to do my time. It's just a lot, a little bit here and a little bit there. And you all understand, I'm sure. It is because I wouldn't want to stay. God knows that. I wouldn't come down here. See, someone said, would you go down there and preach to 30 people when you could be preaching the same thing to 10,000? Certainly. I don't make any sign. I want to see what you see. Cast not your pearls before swine. They turn and trance them under your feet and then will turn and rent you. But you, you don't cast your pearls there. And I feel that what I say here is not casting pearls before swine. I think it's showing children jewels that belong to them. See, the words that jewel found sometimes in the muck and dirt. You ever know what the lily word comes from? Right out of the bottom of the slimy pit of the pond. And it toils day and night to get itself to the light. But when it once gets to the light, it zooms out the most beautiful flower there is. And that's what a lily is. It comes up from the dirt of the earth in the field. That's where the jewels are found, wrapped up out here in this gold state of the nation. Where do you find gold? Down in the dirt. Where do you find the rubies and jewels in the muck and dirt? It's exactly right. That's where we all come from, the muck and dirt of the world. But these here, I'm a prospector. What does a prospector do? He hunts for gold. Then what he does, he shines it, and he beats it out, and he smells it, and he gets it ready. This is the gold mine. And I'm looking through here all the time for beautiful jewels. And find them out here somewhere in the dust and polish them up and say, Lord, here they are. Here's a brother. Here's a born-again Christian. Here's a fine young lady. Here's a fine middle-aged old woman, not young woman. Whatever it is, here they are, Lord. They're your jewels. Put them in your crown, Lord. They'll shine forever and ever like that. Until I see you, shalom. God bless you now. And I 